Welcome to the Doc Talks Podcast, a conversation on what's new and relevant in the world of Canadian medicine and hospital healthcare. I'm your host, Ian Gillespie, and I'm here to ask the questions and find the answers you need to know. We want to help our listeners know how to prevent and detect illness and how to navigate our healthcare system. Be sure to subscribe to the Doc Talks podcast to stay up to date on new episodes and follow us on Twitter at St. Joseph's London or visit sjhc.london.on.ca slash podcast. Hello, I'm Ian Gillespie, and welcome to the Doc Talks podcast, brought to you by St. Joseph's Healthcare London. Today we're talking about poop donation. That's right, I said poop donation. But why would anyone want to donate their poop? More to the point, why would anyone want your donated poop? Well, Dr. Michael Silverman is here with us, and he is going to tell us all about that. Dr. Silverman is the Chief of Infectious Diseases at St. Joseph's Healthcare London and the Chair of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Western University. He's also a pioneer in research and development of fecal microbial transplantation. Dr. Silverman, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. So, basic question, what is fecal transplantation? So when we think of feces, we think of leftover food, but really this is very heavily constituted of micro microbes. So there are billions and trillions of different organisms, thousands of different species, and they are critically important in our being able to, to properly, simply absorb our food, digest our food, but also very involved in metabolism, very involved in our, our maintaining a healthy metabolism, and very involved in the control of our immune system, and they also are in control of each other. So they live in harmony in an ecosystem, and similar to the way in nature, if one component is missing, other components can overgrow. So if you get rid of all the coyotes, you may be flooded with rabbits eating all your crop. A similar thing can happen in your bowels, where there are different organisms, they control each other, and it's very important to have a healthy mix to keep everything in balance. Right. And I might as well hone in on, you're, you're using this fecal transplantation um, for the treatment of C. difficile, mainly, correct? Let, let, can we talk just a little bit about what C. difficile is, basically? So C. difficile is very analogous to the metaphor I gave about the mm -hmm. rabbits. So C. difficile is a bacteria. It can be normal to be in your bowel. Mm -hmm. Up to f about 5% of the population has C. difficile in their bowels at any time. And that's not a problem. It's like not having a few rabbits is not a problem. It's fine. If you get an antibiotic that wipes out the healthy bacteria, then C. difficile overgrows, generally because it's a little more resistant to many antibiotics than are many of the other healthy organisms. And it can overgrow and become the dominant organism in your bowels. And when that happens, it releases a toxin that can cause diarrhea and very severe diarrhea. This is not just a little bit of loose stool now and again. C. difficile can cause very severe diarrhea that can put people in a hospital, can put people in hospital a number of times in the intensive care unit, and unfortunately sometimes people will succumb to the infection from C. difficile. The treatment of C. difficile is to give an antibiotic to try to kill the C. diff. And you would think, okay, so that's easy. We have antibiotics that do that, but it also has spores that are, that are not killed by the antibiotic. And so, and they hang around. And the antibiotic we use to kill C. diff also helps kill, unfortunately, many of the other healthy bacteria. Mm. So you still have an area, the normal organisms that inhibit C. diff are not around. In fact, there's probably less of those organisms that were, than were there when you started the treatment. And so C. diff often relapses when the treatment is over, and people will get it over and over. And many patients will have been fighting C. diff for a year or two years, and during that time, they keep getting episodes of severe diarrhea that keep them housebound, and make them lose weight, and make them chronically ill. And the, on, the way to really profoundly stop and change this whole cycle is to give them back healthy bacteria. 
that can control the C. diff. It's like reinstituting, bringing back some coyotes to a place where they have been extinct. And getting those healthy bacteria from young, healthy people mm -hmm. who have a healthy mix of bacteria seems to be the most potent way we have to do this right now. Right. So we screen people who are healthy mm -hmm. to make sure they don't have any other diseases and to make sure they don't have anything that might be communicable, particularly through their stools. And then they donate the poop. And and we either we clean the poop so that to get rid of any leftover little bits of carrot or whatever that might be left in so that it's almost all bacteria that's in there and then it can be administered to the person who needs it either by an enema or some places do it by a nasogastric tube to put down the nose and then into the stomach or by a colonoscopy which is a medical procedure where people are sedated and a scope is put up through the rectum through the anus in, in, into the colon what we do here most commonly in london and we're one of two centers in Canada that do this, is we put the bacteria into capsules. Mm. And then people can swallow those capsules. And that's generally the least invasive approach. Mm -hmm. And we found excellent response rates with doing Right. It. And so how many of these fecal capsules would a patient have to consume normally? So you've got to take quite a few, but it's one. Oh. So people come in on an empty stomach, Generally, what they do is they take the antibiotic to control the C. diff because we don't want them to be having rip-roaring diarrhea when we're doing this. Otherwise, the capsules may wash right through them and pop out the other end. So we want their bowel movements to be normal. And then they stop the antibiotic. It's called vancomycin is the one that we use most commonly 24 hours before so that it's not around and won't kill the transplant when they take it. And then the evening before the transplant, they take a laxative that we often refer to as a bowel washout, similar to if people have ever had a colonoscopy. So taking a look up uh, into the colon, uh, it, it's hard to see much unless you're washed out to make it empty so that they can see all the walls of the colon. So it's a bowel washout, and that gets rid of a lot of the harmful bacteria and reduces the number of bacteria so that the healthy ones can take over and colonize the gut. And then that morning, people come in on an empty stomach, and we encourage them to come on an empty stomach so that they can swallow all these capsules, because it's a not lot of capsules to swallow. We give them a bottle of water, and they sit over about a half an hour and drink. Generally, it's about 35 capsules. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're taking one or two at a time at most, slowly taking them over about a half hour. And then we just watch them for usually about 15 minutes to make sure everything's okay. And generally, everything is okay. It's extremely rare, extremely rare to have a problem. And then uh, people go home and it's done. Just a one-time procedure in most cases? One-time procedure and it's done. They take them all then and then they're fine. The big thing after that is to avoid getting antibiotics if oh, at all okay. possible. Now, clearly, if someone has a life-threatening infection, people need an antibiotic. But... Uh, many antibiotics are used, quote, just to be on the safe side, quote, unquote, mm -hmm. and to make sure that antibiotics are only used in the setting where they're absolutely necessary. And when they are used, to use the safest ones, like the ones with the narrowest spectrum that affect the least number of organisms and so are less likely to wipe out all the healthy bacteria and let the C. diff take over again. I think, like a lot of people, I, I was not aware of this procedure, but you've been doing this for quite a while now. Is that correct? I've been doing this since 2003. Mm. We've been using the capsules for about four to five years okay. now. Before that, or early on, we were doing it by enema. Now, to do it by enema, usually you have to repeat the procedure about a week later. Some groups do it more than twice. Some groups do it three times. Because, of course, when you give it by enema, you only get the bacteria in the rectum and the very distal part of the colon. You do not get organisms throughout the whole colon and, for sh and not in the small bowel. One of the advantages of the capsules is they come down and they repopulate the whole bowel. And we think that's one reason why they're so much more effective. And they're also more convenient in many ways because you only have to do it once. And let's talk briefly about the donors. I, I, uh, you made an interesting comment. You compared it to uh, uh, becoming a donor was you had a better chance of getting into Harvard than becoming a, a fecal donor. Is that right? Like the standards are quite high, I imagine. 
the standards are quite high, but there are people who are, you know, who are in good shape. Mm -hmm. And it's true that our acceptance rate is lower than the acceptance rate at Harvard, where the percentage of people applying, there's a higher percentage getting accepted. But that said, you know, people often self-select. And we need healthy people between the ages of 18 and 50 mm -hmm. who are not on any medications, mm -hmm. generally who are eating a balanced diet. And uh, although we, we don't need a, a specific diet, but, you know, a balanced diet is helpful and have not recently been on antibiotics, have not in the past 30 days been to the tropics. And so the, because often in the tropics, they're exposed to tropical infections, which could be transmitted in the sure. bowels. And, you know, we have a number of screening procedures we do. So we check the stools, we check blood tests, we do swabs to make sure they're not carrying organisms. Many people carry organisms that are not troubling them at all, that they do not need any treatment for. However, in a vulnerable person, an elderly person, someone with, whose immune system is down, that organism could become problematic. And so we have to screen to make sure that they're not carrying any of these things. Our life became more complex with COVID, of yeah. course, because with COVID, we have to make sure we screen each time that someone drops off to make sure that they don't have COVID mm -hmm. because people may be asymptomatically shedding COVID and COVID can come out in the stools. Whether it's infectious or not in the stools, we don't know, but we didn't want to demonstrate it could be infectious by transmitting it that way. And so in an abundance of caution. We do screen all everybody, both their nose, and we screen the stools to make sure there's no COVID. In right. The I don't know. I'm checking my notes. I don't know where I saw this, but you don't have very many fecal donors at all. Is that correct? No, we don't have many. And the it, we need an ongoing supply mm -hmm. of people. We're looking for people who are willing to do this on an ongoing basis, right. not just to do it once. Mm -hmm. Because... We have to do a number of tests to make sure the person does not have any transmissible diseases. Sure. And these tests can be somewhat expensive. So now the patient, the donor doesn't pay for any mm -hmm. of this, but we don't want to go through that whole series of tests for someone who's interested in donating once. And because then that would be, you know, not economical. So, and people, you know, we screen them. And then when they, if they pass all that screening, then they're eligible to be a donor, and then we they do it on an ongoing basis. However, even people who've passed all the screening can be fine and great, then they get strep throat, and someone gives them an antibiotic, which mm. they needed because okay. they had a bad strep throat, and they're no longer eligible for quite some time until their normal bacteria come back. Or they go to the tropics and they get diarrhea there, and now they're not eligible for a long time until everything goes back to normal and the, the normal organisms take over again. So we need more people than we have. We don't need 10,000 donors, mm -hmm. but we do need a number more donors to help. COVID is also complicated things because once someone gets COVID, they're not eligible to donate for another three months because of the possibility that COVID could be shed for a prolonged period of time in the stool. And this has made this past summer particularly difficult because some of our long-term donors have come down with COVID. And if two or three come down with COVID, we're really in a difficult situation. So uh, how many donors do you have approximately? So right now we have about five donors who've been giving on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. But again, if two or three of those five have a problem, we're in, we're in difficulty. Some of them are graduate students or undergraduate students. And then, you know, and they've, they've been great. But naturally, you know, they may get a job in British Columbia or something, and then they're no longer eligible to donate. So we do need new people on a regular basis. And, you know, and particularly people who live not too far from London, within the London area, so that they can drop off uh, samples without too much difficulty and do it on a regular basis. If they think they're eligible, we'd love to hear from them. I imagine at the end of the show, or we'll we'll put a, attach a link uh, to the website and uh, a number and uh, a coordinator to call for those who might want to volunteer Absolutely. for this. So yeah. that'll be on the website. And because we are looking for people to come forward, it's a great good deed. By doing this, you can change someone's life and you may even save a life because unfortunately, some people with this illness without fecal transplants can succumb to the illness. And how... You said you've been doing this since 2003. 
how did somebody get this idea? How did, how did this um, says evolve originally? Well, it's amazing. I mean, it's been thought of over time, even in, in ancient times, it was used that people talked about yellow soup that people would drink for illness, or for diarrhea. But of course, they weren't screening and they weren't... Sorry, the yellow soup was urine? Was poop. Was oh, where they oh, mixed poop. some... Right. Yeah, they mixed okay. them poop and they, they mixed it with various things and they would drink it as a soup. We're not advocating. Nice. I want to emphasize, no one should do this on their own at home without <laughs> the donor being screened, without checking. Because as I said, a very high percentage of people do carry organisms that are not bothering them, but could bother mm -hmm. someone else. Right. So just saying, well, I know them well and they seem like a good person, that's all true. <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't mean that they unknowingly are carrying an organism. They're not unknowingly carrying an organism that could be a problem for you that's not bothering them. And so it's very important that people are properly screened. And this is one of the most complex parts of the process is screening to make sure that we don't miss things. And in the 1950s, it was tried once or twice by some people. But Really, C. difficile exploded in terms of number of cases with increasing use of antibiotics, increasing hmm. in, in, in intensity of antibiotic use also in hospitals has been an issue. And people will say, well, why don't hospitals just not use antibiotics? But modern antibiotics have allowed us to do many things that we couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So for very many surgeries, there's the risk, you know, when you're cutting through some of the barriers, the mucosal barriers, there's going to be some bacteria spread, and without use of antibiotics, there's a high rate of infection, and use of antibiotics can make these surgeries safe and accessible. But the problem is C. diff is a potential downside. And so the number of cases of C. diff rose very dramatically, particularly in the 80s and 90s, and has remained high. It's improved as we've tried to get better infection control in hospitals and mm. more control of antibiotic use and better hand hygiene, people washing their hands, etc. But even with the best optimal means of control, it's not like we're going to be able to say we'll not use any more antibiotics anymore. Sure. We're still going to need them. And when you cluster people who need antibiotics together, like in hospitals, then C. diff can spread widely. But it also happens to people in the community. We see a number of people who had an infected tooth and got an antibiotic from a dentist and otherwise were well and got very severe C. diff afterwards. Wow. So it's not rare, unfortunately, mm. C. diff rates r rose. And because of that, the need for fecal transplants rose. There was a small study done in Scandinavia where they showed that this worked by uh, putting a na nasogastric tube, a tube down the nose and giving the fecal transplant into the stomach. And they had in patients with recurrent C. diff and they did re relatively well. Mm -hmm. they, they did much better than they would do with just using antibiotics for C. diff alone, dramatically better. We had people in Canada and in the US with the same problem. I had patients who were having multiple episodes of C. diff, had been hospitalized, had been in the ICU multiple times, were in desperate straits to stop this from happening again, could not afford to stay on the, med the medication any longer because could not afford the medication and were having side effects from the medication and were desperate for an alternative and so we started doing the fecal transplants and they were remarkably effective we were doing them by enema at that time there wasn't a protocol for it we had to come up with our own protocol to do it the way i did it was well how are you going to make poop that's solid be able to be squirted up into the bum so it's got to be liquid i thought well maybe we should, if we make it the consistency of a milkshake <laughs> And I know how to make a milkshake You from doing it with the kids. You know, you do one part ice cream and about four parts milk, and then you mix it up, and usually that does it. And so we did one part poop and four parts salt water, sterile salt water, mixed it in a blender and put it up through an enema bag, and sure enough, it worked. Wow. I mean, it worked really well. And Fascinating, um, but I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to visit you. If you're going to serve me a chocolate milkshake, I'm not drinking it. I just No, we don't serve. That's a, that's, that is something we do joke about a lot. Don't <laughs> accept chocolate milkshakes from an FMT 
program director. So, yeah, but it, the people who get this see their lives change. And what's the success rate, Dr. Silverman? So with the capsules, we're running a success rate of about 97%. Wow. So it's really dramatic. Whereas just giving the antibiotics over and over when just trying again, in the first time people get the antibiotics, they work relatively well and about 80% are cured, but 20% will get it again. But if you're in one who's already had it, now you're twice, now you're running around 65%. And then if you're doing it the third time because you've relapsed, now you're starting to get around 30% likelihood that it's going to stop. And many of these people have gone through six, seven times of the antibiotic. And each time when they stop the antibiotic, within two to three weeks or a month after, they get severely ill again and often have to go back to the hospital. So um, any though uh, patients require a second transplantation at all? or When we do it by enema, we often have to do it more than once. Okay. When we do it by capsules, generally once is enough. Hmm. Now, sometimes we have to do it again because someone developed a severe infection somewhere else that's unrelated, and they had to take an antibiotic. Right. And then that killed the transplant. And that's probably the most common reason why we find that we have to do it again. The longer they wait after the transplant before getting the antibiotic, the less likely this happens again. But by you know, people can have, unfortunately, bad luck and that they, they get a severe infection you know, shortly after that's unrelated to the transplant. It's not related to any bacteria that are in, in the bowels, but they get a bacteria. They just happen to catch something that causes a severe infection. Often, if we choose our antibiotics carefully and use ones that are narrow spectrum, they will not get the C. diff again, even though they recently had a transplant. If it's like a year later, often they'll do very they'll do very well because the transplant is really in what we call engrafted. The bacteria have been living there for a while. They are now part of your normal flora is what we say, is what we refer to as the normal bacteria living in your gut, and so they'll handle it like anyone else. But if they, through bad luck, have to be on an antibiotic two weeks after the transplant then sometimes we'll have to do the transplant again. Sure. Now, are, are there other conditions or diseases, other applications of fecal transplants uh, apart from the C. difficile? So for C. difficile, that's the one where this is considered the standard of practice and where this is in all the guidelines that, that it should be used in people who have had recurrent C. difficile. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's a lot of hope and some early evidence that this may be helpful in several other conditions. In fact, the number of conditions that this might be helpful in just keeps getting longer and longer. And that's because we realize that these bacteria in the gut are not just sitting there, but they are very metabolically active and are having a lot of effects on our bodies. So our group uh, and some others have also been looking at it for what's called metabolic syndrome. So people who gain weight and then develop high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes and fatty liver. And we've done a study in fatty liver and showed that it can help certain aspects of the condition. Others have tried it in diabetes and obesity. It's still, again, experimental, but there's some pr promising evidence that it could lead to benefit. It also has been tried in certain autoimmune conditions, and we are planning a study with rheumatoid arthritis. We've done one study in, in multiple sclerosis. Again, very preliminary. A lot of the studies at this point are showing whether it's safe in those conditions mm -hmm. and then hoping to show efficacy thereafter. The one where it's been in many ways most promising has been in certain forms of cancers where the immune system is being used to treat the cancer. So it, in particularly um, metastatic melanoma, so it's a form of skin cancer that can spread and can cause a life-threatening disease in, in lung cancer and in renal cancer, kidney cancer. We have studies ongoing in all of those. We're planning one for pancreatic cancer. There are drugs called immune checkpoint inhibitors, and those drugs allow your immune system to attack the cancer when otherwise it might not. It seems that the fecal transplant may be synergistic with those drugs to in encourage the immune system to attack the cancer. That data is very early, very preliminary. It's not part of the standard of practice. It's only being used in clinical studies, but it is very exciting. and We're actively pursuing this. Huh. Wow, that's amazing. And so again, we want to encourage 
I guess, people, yes, who potential um, poop donors. And I just want to, again, go over. So those who pass the stringent tests for their, their fit and healthy and so on and so forth, they, what, defecate at home, keep it, what do they do? Keep it in the fridge overnight and then bring it in in a special container? Is that how it works? And right. How, yeah. So so most people defecate in the morning. That's right. usually, you know, after, after breakfast or before breakfast. That's the most common pattern. But different people are different. Some people defecate multiple times a day. Some people defecate in the evening. So if, if it's in the morning, then it's easier. People defecate into like a plastic hat. <laughs> I like a, it's like a plastic bowl they put over the top of the toilet seat and the poop falls into that. We give them this wooden spatula that's like, you know, and they scoop it into the in, into a container and tighten the lid and put it in a plastic bag. And then if it's going to be overnight, you know, we ask them to keep it in the fridge. But, you know, you can put it in a bag. Nobody can see it. It's sealed inside of a sealed bag. It's not going to smell. It's not going to affect anything. We, we ideally like people to bring it in soon, like we don't want it sure. to be kept over the weekend, so we want people to bring it in as soon as possible so that the organisms are still alive and still and still viable. And people do this, you know, it, some people will drop it off once or twice a week, some people twice a month. Sometimes we find, oh, you know, there's a number of people who need it this week and we'll call one of the donors any way you can make a drop off, an extra drop off this week. And uh, and our donors have been excellent about this in terms of being very flexible because they realize that, you know, these people really need this and they're, these people are in, in difficult straits. Mm -hmm. They either have severe C. diff and recurrent C. diff. Sometimes we use it for people who we can't bring the C. diff under control, even with antibiotics, and they're extremely ill in the intensive care unit, in which case we need it very promptly. And others are in, a, in studies and they're hoping to start their therapy for their cancer and they need the fecal transplant to be started before the, before the other cancer treatments can start. So, but people have been very flexible and very good and they bring it in and, and we really appreciate it. It's a wonderful good deed. As we say, you were only going to flush it down the toilet anyway. It's not like you had other uses for it and it could save someone's life. Wow. Well, it's fascinating. And uh, Dr. Silverman, I, we appreciate you uh, coming here today and giving us the scoop on the poop. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the puns were kept to the very end and to a relative minimum, although I'm, I'm not against puns at all. And this episode is now cool. in the can, Dr. Silverman. Yes, it is. Yeah. Have you got another uh, one before we before we end up? Just, what's your? Give me another pun. Give me another poop joke. You got any others? Uh, well, I just hope that, you know, People show they care, show they can give, show they give a crap. And, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, All right. Well, it's a fascinating topic, and uh, we appreciate your time, Dr. Silverman. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you very much. This episode of Fecal Transplantation is now officially in the can. So that's it. If you're interested in learning more, visit St. Joseph's website at sjhc.london.on.ca. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at St. Joseph's London to keep updated on our next episode. Until then, stay healthy. <laughs>